Good evening. Welcome to Hastings Mystery Theater. I'm your host and mystery master, Randall Schaefer. Tonight, the corridors of mystery take us to 1939 for an RKO production, Sued for Libel. The city is on edge, waiting for a jury to declare Albert Pomeroy guilty or not guilty of murder. A radio newscaster is keeping his show on the air, waiting for the verdict that is expected any minute. A friend in the courtroom promised to phone as soon as the verdict is announced, and then he will release the information on the air. Well, the verdict is not guilty, but the friend plays a joke, <laughs> some joke, and tells the newscaster that the verdict was guilty. So the newscaster broadcasts guilty all over the, tele the radio audience and thereby opens his station to a million-dollar lawsuit, which leads to another murder. Our star is Kent Taylor. He was born in Iowa in 1907, and nothing in his family background predicted an acting career. A friend said he's handsome enough to be an actor, and with no more encouragement than that, he headed for Hollywood. Well, his friend was right. His good looks got him a contract with Paramount. Kent Taylor made 110 movies from 1933 through 1974. He was often the star in B movies, but was a supporting actor in the more expensive A movies. In the early 1950s, television killed off the B movies, but Kent Taylor became even more successful on television. He's best remembered for playing Boston Blackie in the 1950s TV series, and he also starred in the TV show The Rough Riders during the 1958 and 59 seasons. The creators of Superman got the name Clark Kent from the two most handsome actors in Hollywood, according to the creators of Superman. It was Clark Gable, and Kent Taylor, Clark Kent. Kent Taylor died in 1987 at the age of 79. Let's return to 1939 and enjoy Sued for Libel. gentlemen of the jury, not to be influenced by the flagrant appeal the defense has made to your sympathies. The people have proved beyond a reasonable doubt that Albert Pomeroy is guilty. That in cold blood and with malice aforethought, he did take the life of Edward Webster, his best friend and his business partner. I've been associated with many trials, ladies and gentlemen, and if ever a guilty man was brought before the bar of justice, that man is Albert Pomeroy. I have the utmost respect for Mr. Pomeroy's attorney, Mr. Walsh, a very able counselor. But when he tells you that his client is not guilty of murder, Mr. Walsh is... Mr. Walsh is very badly mistaken. I must also ask the jury to weigh very carefully the testimony of Mrs. Muriel Webster, wife of the deceased. The defense would have you believe she testified in Pomeroy's behalf because she sincerely believes he's innocent. But I say to you, the reason for that testimony is because she's in love with Pomeroy. The people submit, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, that you have no alternative but to find Albert Pomeroy guilty. Guilty of murder in the first degree. Thank you. Well, that'll burn Pomeroy all right. Look at Mrs. Webster. She's worried to death. 
She certainly pals you wellsy with a guy who turned her husband into a corpus delicti. Five will get you ten. They turn Pomeroy loose. I wouldn't take your money. He's as guilty as sin. Sure he is. But he had Walsh defending him and Webster's widow to testify for him. Howard! Smiley, for the love of Mike! Shh, Maggie. Do you want to be in contempt of court? Oh, oof. One more outburst like that, and I'll hold you in contempt of court. I will now instruct you as to the law applicable to this case upon which you will base your verdict. You have heard the evidence presented on behalf of the people and the evidence presented on behalf of the defendant. It is your duty to weigh this evidence carefully, remembering that the life of a human being hangs upon your decision. If you are convinced that any witness has testified falsely in any respect, then you are instructed to disregard the entire testimony of that witness as being probably false. If the evidence leaves you with any reasonable doubt as to the defendant's guilt in any degree, then it is your duty to return a verdict of not guilty. If you are convinced by the evidence presented that the defendant is guilty, then it is your duty to return a verdict of guilty. And it is your privilege to determine the degree of guilt, whether it be first degree murder, second degree murder, or manslaughter. You will now retire for your deliberations. The fate of Albert Pomeroy is in the hands of the jury. Is he guilty of slaying his best friend? Will he be found innocent? Will the jury be able to agree on a verdict? You have just heard the afternoon edition of Drama in the News, a twice daily broadcast of dramatized news events presented by the Evening Bulletin over its own radio station, NYEB. Should a verdict be reached in the Pomeroy trial, it will be enacted in the evening edition of Drama in the News tonight at 8 o'clock. Your announcer is Douglas Evans. This is station NYEB, the voice of the evening bulletin. Good show, Steve. Thanks. Mr. Lonning and Mr. Hastings want to see you in his office. Okay. <laughs> Three guesses what Hastings wants. Oh, Steve, <coughs> has a kid been coming in to see me? Darn good little actress. I thought <coughs> maybe you could use her in one of your broadcasts. <laughs> Just been looking through your script for tonight's edition of Drama in the News. Were you thrilled? Yeah, but you've only dramatized one verdict of the Pomeroy trial. If he's found guilty, he'll be up a tree. We'll have to fill in with pipe organ music. Which would break your heart at $18 an hour. Oh, but you can relax. Your 18 bucks are safe. I've got all three verdicts ready. Guilty, not guilty, and disagreement. Fine. Molly will phone me from the courtroom the minute the verdict comes in. Oh. Allow me. No, thanks. <laughs> Don't be childish. Your tricks always make me nervous. I'm sorry. Here, catch. Get out of here. Oh, Steve. Uh, one thing more. There's a kid been dropping into my office. Darn good little actress. And uh, I thought if you could find a spot for her in one of your broadcasts. Why, Mr. Hastings. Well, I just thought I'd ask. <clears throat> <clears throat> Honey, if that wolf should ever ask you how you'd like to go in the air, ask him how he'd like to take it. Don't worry, I've got his number. I've got yours. I'm mad at you. Me? Now, what did I do? Nothing, that's just the trouble. You used to bring me roses every day. I kind of liked you then. Well, in that case... Steve, they're lovely. Do I get a kiss? No. Well, in that case... But, Albert, suppose they do find you guilty. Muriel, how many times must I tell you there isn't a chance? Walter's taken care of that. But you never know what a jury will do. My dear, that's the mental reminder an attorney gives himself every time he steps into a courtroom. Then you're not sure. You think they may convict him. Now, now, dear. Hit it. Seven. 
Tá bosta. What's the idea? Pomeroy had waltz by these for all of us. If they didn't electrocute him in this state, they could use this rope to hang Pomeroy. I don't see much of Steve since the bulletin put him in charge of that radio program. How's he doing? Terrible. He's even getting offers from breakfast food companies. think this is? Bullseye. You dirty rat. Uh, I gotta go down and get me a sandwich. Can I bring you something, honey? No. How about a cheese on rye? Well, all right. Girl. No hard feelings? <laughs> oh, no. Kidding? Hey, Joey, if they get a verdict, phone me in the cafe downstairs, will you? All right. Deal me in, huh? No. Thanks. That's it. They got a verdict. Take it easy. Maybe they only won't ask for some additional instructions. I've got to phone downstairs and tell Smiley. Wait, Joey. Uh, it may be a false alarm, and if it's a verdict, I'll take care of them. I haven't got a deadline for an hour. Okay. This is it. The jury. Let's go inside. Warm up the jab, will you, sister? What do you mean, warm it up? What are you crying about? There's a tip for you. The 8 o'clock edition of Drama in the News, presented for your entertainment by the Evening Bulletin. Bulletin. Flames destroy a million-dollar warehouse, taking a toll of three lives. Hmm, well, Bessie, Steve's on the air already. Looks like he'll miss the verdict. I bet you Palmer is acquitted. He's too nice looking to be a murderer. Now, you see, that's what's wrong with the jury system. He will read the verdict. The defendant will rise and face the jury. We, the jury, in the case of the people versus Albert Pomeroy, find the defendant not guilty. Oh, Albert. Albert, congratulations. Thank you, dear. And thanks to you, Jerry. Jury dismissed. What do you say now, Pomeroy? Well, How does it feel to be acquitted? I'll bet you're glad this is over. Yeah, Give us a bet. statement, Walt. On behalf of my client, I'll say we've never had a moment's doubt that the verdict would be anything other than one of not guilty. Yes, because you see, I wasn't guilty. How about you, Mrs. Webster? Can we have a statement from you? Oh, please. Oh, that's all right. You may quote me as saying that I never at any time believed Mr. Pomeroy guilty of killing my... my husband. They were such good friends. It was... just impossible. Thank you. Hey, don't forget Smiley. Oh, Smiley. I won't. Answer the telephone. Quick and hot. That's right. Yeah, he's here. Just a minute. Hey, it's for you. Must have got a hoodie. Shut that thing off. Yeah? Hello, Smiley. Maggie. The jury just came in. They found him guilty. No. No recommendation for mercy. You're welcome. Oh. Give me Bryant 9, 5854. Looks like the ladies of the jury didn't go for Mr. Pomeroy. Now, give me Steve Lonigan. He's in Studio C. Tell him it's Smiley. Get that hose up on the roof over there. I can't do it, Chief. The wall's about to go. There's three men inside there. They'll be buried alive if that wall collapses. We've got to get up on that roof. Here comes another ambulance. Sam, get back. The wall's going to go. We'll all be killed. Run for your lives, boys. There go the ambulance. Tragedy strikes again. Three firemen dead as flames destroy the million-dollar inter-ocean warehouse. Hello? Hello, Smiley. Guilty. No recommendation for mercy. Thanks. Pomeroy, get it in the neck? Yeah.
And here's the flash we've been waiting for. The verdict in the Pomeroy murder trial. The evening bulletin presents a dramatized enactment of the jury's decision. We'll stop at the Cape Cat Club for a few drinks. Then supper in the surf room. And then we'll start out and make the rounds. <laughs> and between you and me, I feel like making a night of it. We've all been under a terrible strain. That's right. Let's have a little music. We deserve a celebration. I'm not after music. I want to hear the evening bulletin's dramatized news program. They've been giving us dirty digs all during the trial, and I'm just human enough to want to gloat a little. And gentlemen of the jury, have you reached a verdict? We have, Your Honor. You will hand your verdict to the clerk of the court. The clerk will read the verdict. We, the jury, in the case of the People versus Albert Pomeroy, find the defendant guilty of murder in the first degree. Guilty? Say, what is this? Quiet. I congratulate the jury upon its courageous verdict, which is only one more proof that in this state and county, no one, regardless of wealth or position, can get away with murder. Oh, Albert, Mr. Walsh. Be still, my dear. Ms. Webster, I'm from the Evening Bulletin. Will you give me a statement, please? You may quote me as saying that I'm happy that justice has been done and that the murder of my husband will pay for his horrible crime with his life. Turn around, take us to radio station NYEB and step on it. There you are, lady. What's this? Your sandwich. Oh, thanks. Smiley, do you spell a tittle with a C and a Q or only with a Q? With a CQ. Why don't you get yourself a dictionary? What? How do you like this? Smiles wreathing his face. Albert Palmer tonight heard a jury find him not guilty of the murder of Edward Webster. Immediately after his acquittal, he was found to... What do you mean, acquittal? That's right, acquittal. Spelled with a CQ. Next time, be careful what you do with those paper wads. Steve. What about Steve? That phone. He didn't broadcast what I told you about... I hope not. Give me Steve Lonigan. He's at the broadcasting station in Studio C. I don't care if he is on the air. This is a matter of life and death. Oh, gee, Smiley. I wouldn't do that to Steve for me and... Why don't you dry up? I was just pulling a rib. I thought you'd go back to the office and write the story for the morning. I thought you'd find out in plenty of time. Do me a favor and stop thinking, will you? Hello. Oh, hello, Smiley. Say thanks for the great job. We just got off the air and... What? Oh, well, sure we broadcasted. But Smiley, what you said... Oh, I don't know. I'll see what I can do. Great broadcast, Steve. That dramatization of the verdict ought to knock him cold. Yeah, great. <laughs> Pomeroy was acquitted. Yes, well, he had it coming to him. <laughs> hey, what did you say? I said Pomeroy was acquitted. Yes, sir. He's outside now with his attorney. They want to see you. We've been sued for slander before, and we usually licked them. You can't collect damages unless you can prove you've been damaged. But in Palmeroy's case, he can probably prove damages. Being in the brokerage business, he can claim that that broadcast cost him a lot of clients. Suppose Palmeroy does have us over a barrel. Do you have to keep reminding me of it? Well, I was... Who'll pay the damages? You or I? The worst of it is Palmeroy's guilty of sin. While they were laying three to one, he'd go to the chair. So I have to pay a million dollars so you can shoot paper wads. I ought to fire the both of you. Yes, sir. But I won't. Thank you. So Pomeroy wants a fight, eh? Well, that's what he'll get. Steve, we'll nail Pomeroy to the cross. We'll hang Walsh as high as Haman. We'll discredit them publicly as two of the most contemptible rascals we've ever crucified in print. That suits me. But how? You got me, Steve. I told you you were going to get yourself in trouble with that broadcast, Steve. Even the freedom of the press doesn't entitle you to call a man a murderer if he's innocent. Oh, no, you got yourself in a nice little jam, my boy. I'll be hanged if I'm going to pull your chestnuts out of the fire for you. Steve wouldn't have been in the jam if you hadn't let Walsh make a monkey out of you. Now, look here, Smiley. You had Palmer right dead to rights. And yet Walsh shot your case so full of holes, it looked like the moors had been in it. Is that so? If I ever get that cheap trickster into court again, I'll blow him right into the disbarment proceedings. Say, you can get him into court again. If you do what I want you to do. Look, I've got a hunch that Palmer's investment company is strictly phony that he's paying dividends out of stock sales, floating new stock issues to keep the money rolling in, and securing those stock issues with corporations that don't exist. Oh, no, Steve, that's the old bucket shop game. Pomeroy's too smart for that. Still, I wonder. Pomeroy's whole suit for slander is based on the claim that our broadcast hurt his brokerage firm. If we can prove that his firm is crooked, he can't collect a dime. And you will have the pleasure of getting back at him and Walsh for that lily they pinned on you.
All right, I'll do it. I'll subpoena his books and have them audited right away. But wait a minute. Not one word of this in the bulletin or on the radio till we find something. If we do. So help me. Corbin, you're a very smart man. Yeah. Yeah, I hope so. That's all for this edition. I'm writing a feature for the final. The courthouse cat chased a mouse up under Judge Galloway's robes, causing an adjournment. Right. Bye-bye. Hi, Smiley. Hello, Steve. Big shot now, huh? Doesn't every reporter can get his paper sued for me and smackaroos? Smiley, here's a skit I've written for my broadcast tonight. Read it to me. I want to hear what it sounds like. Okay. <clears throat> Announcer's voice. Justice removes blindfold. Viper in the bosom of newspaper profession gets just desserts. Girl's voice, imitating Maggie Shane of the Clarion, says, Oh, Steve, it was all a mistake. I didn't mean to get you into any trouble. Man's voice, imitating Steve Lonigan of the Bulletin, says, Miss Shane, I have only one thing to say to you. As the sound effect comes in here, Steve. Go ahead, I want to hear that, too. Ooh. I guess I had that coming, so I'll let it ride. But I never thought I'd see the day when you'd lose your sense of humor. Now, what would you do if your paper was being sued for a million dollars? Die laughing? Yeah, you probably would. Oh, well, what are you kicking about? You've got your job. That's more than I've got. You were pointing a story when we came in. I'm through Saturday. Colonel White phoned my city editor. The Bullet and Clarion have always fought each other's battles, you know. Yeah. Oh, gee, that's kind of tough. Mm hmm What are you going to do? Uh, I'm going to a meeting of the amateur magicians tonight after my broadcast. That's nice. But I'll get through early and uh, maybe we can get together and talk things over. We can't have you around here mooching hamburgers. You're a sweetheart. Sure, just ask any of the girls. See you tonight, Maggie? All right. Come on, slug. Go on, slug. Uh, boys, we all use uh, rabbits in our tricks. Uh, you buy them, I make them. And this is the way. Two eggs, white ones. Don't forget the shells. Then a little seasoning. A little fire. Also the match. Covering up the fire. Magic pistol. Out pops. Thank you, Frank. Thank you. And now, last but not least, Brother Steve Lonigan and his Chinese head jumper. A gruesome little offering which you'll all lose your heads over. Steve Lonigan. Thank you, boys. Thanks. Now, what you're looking at is a reproduction of a genuine Chinese head chopper. This steel blade is sharpened to a very keen edge. The cabbage, please. As you can see. And now, boys, to further demonstrate its effectiveness, I'll have to call on one of you. Teddy, how about you? Oh, come on. What can I lose? <laughs> Seems a shame. All right, Teddy, just place the neck in here, resting it gently on the Adam's apple. You nervous? Well, I've never done this before. Well, you've got nothing on me, neither have I. And if it doesn't work, what's the difference? You never use your head anyway. Uh, the basket, just in case. Well, we can go two ways with this trick. Either it works or it doesn't. We'll soon find out. Say, ah. Uh. Ah. Uh. It works. All right, Teddy. Did it hurt? If you say no, don't shake your head. Thanks very much, Teddy. Thanks, boys. That's all for tonight, boys. Yeah, Say, Steve, you're a pretty cagey sort of a fellow, aren't you? Oh, I don't know. Well, I am. 
Hey, what's the idea? You gave me the bird, didn't you? Yes. Give me my back here. My hat, please. About time. What are you, a dormizer? Sure, we've got secrets. Hey, Steve. How'd you get in here? I didn't until the meeting was over. We never allow visitors during club meetings. Oh. I was just learning how to make a birdie disappear. Yeah, well, Colonel White's going to show you how to make a job disappear. Do you know the DA's been looking for you for two hours? Well, come on, tell me about it. Night, Steve. All right. What did he want? Pomeroy's having a party at his house tonight for the directors of all his corporations and their wives. Will Corbin have a man there? How can he? He can't get a guy in the house without a warrant. Well, if Pomeroy's business isn't on the level, it's sure to be discussed at that party. Smiley, I got an idea. Yeah? Sure, you're all right. Your own mother wouldn't know you behind all that spinach. You'll be all right, too. You've got a veil, haven't you? Yes, but I've never worn one before. And if it slips, we're a couple of dead pigeons. <laughs> Don't worry. If I think they're getting suspicious, I'll saw you in two and make you disappear. <laughs> well, here we are. Come, princess. Mr. Pomeroy's residence? Uh, yes, sir. I'm Yogi Hassan. Uh, this is Princess Salome. We're magicians. We're sent out to entertain Mr. Pomeroy's guests. Why, uh, Mr. Pomeroy did not inform me, sir, that we were to expect to entertain it. Well, that's quite all right. Mr. Pomeroy doesn't know anything about it. Very well. It was arranged by one of his friends for us to come out. I'll tell Mr. Pomeroy. He's out there in the garden. In the garden? Yes, sir, with Mrs. Webster, sir. Well, never mind. Uh, we'll find him ourselves. Thank you. Steve, you're going to get us into trouble. What kind of trouble? There's no law against dressing up as magicians. No, well, there should be. Look, the Pomeroy and Mrs. Webster are together. They're probably discussing exactly what we want to hear. Come on. I tell you, Muriel, it's too risky. We can't afford to take that kind of a chance. But there's nothing to stop us from being married now. It's too soon after the trial. But, darling, what do we care? You've already been acquitted. They can't do anything more to you. I know, I know, but we have other things to consider. Now, what are you two doing out here? Oh, uh, excuse me, dear. Well, we were just looking for Mr. Pomeroy. What's the meaning of this, Cooper? They were spying on you, sir. Spying on us? We were doing no such thing. Uh, uh, we were just making ourselves invisible. We're magicians uh, sent out to entertain your guests. I didn't send for any magicians. Haven't I seen you somewhere before? And haven't I even met you? Your voice is very familiar. Oh, no, I'm sure we've never had the pleasure, Mr. Pomeroy. You see, uh, we just came in from a vaudeville tour. Oh. Well, it's all right, Cooper. Yeah, it's all right, Cooper. Just a minute. I believe we have met these people before. Would you mind removing that veil and black wig? Oh, well, it, it's kind of cold out here. Come on. Do you know her? Say, this girl's a reporter. Well, you, you see, I, I'm a magician in my spare time. And don't you think you'd better take off the false whiskers, too? Steve Lonigan. Well, it's nice to have seen you again, Mr. Pomeroy. And if you don't think we're magicians, just watch. Oh. Don't worry, Mr. Pomeroy. I'll catch him. No, let them go. What do you suppose they were doing here? I don't know, but I'll take care of them. It won't be necessary for you to warn Mr. Lonigan against any repetition of last night's nonsense. I should regret being forced to put you under a bond to keep the peace. All right, all right, but if you think for one minute you're going to get away with that slander suit... No thinking to it, Lonigan. I have an open and shut case. That's all I've got to say. Except this. If you don't stay out from underfoot, you're going to regret it. I mean that. Good day, gentlemen. Steve, we gotta do something. Sure. But what? Well, he's been acquitted. You can't try a man twice for the same murder. Looks as if we're licked, Steve. No, we're not. 
Colonel, the man never lived who didn't do something he wouldn't want in a newspaper. I'm going back into Pomeroy's private life. I'll get something on him, even if it's nothing worse than a blonde. And when I do, I'll threaten to plaster it all over that front page unless he withdraws that suit. But, Steve, that's blackmail. Sure it is. you mind? I love it. Why, I've traced Pomeroy's name through every file in the county building. Assessor's office, building department, securities division, civil courts. What do you know? The guy hasn't even been sued for breach of promise. Maybe he never made any promises. What would the DA's audit show? Nothing. His business is absolutely on the level. Too bad Stella Trent didn't wait a couple of years before she killed herself. Who's Stella Trent? Palmer's secretary. You remember Smile. I killed herself about three years ago. Yeah. Before you came to New York. Say, wait a minute. Not a chance. It was a clear case of suicide. I covered the story myself. All right, but is there any reason she couldn't have done it because Pomeroy broke her heart? None, except some guy beat Pomeroy to it. Yes, that's right. A uh, young doctor by the name of Baylor. She phoned Baylor she was going to shoot herself. He heard the shot right over the telephone. He phoned the police. They found her on the floor of her apartment. There she was, dead in a doornail. Her picture's right here. Where? There on the wall. Right there. Oh, this one, huh? Mm. I wish she'd waited until now to kill herself. Why, we could have built up into a mystery. Maybe even got Paulo indicted. <laughs> well, she didn't. And it'd be a dirty trick to play on her folks now to try and pin a scandal on her after three years. Yeah. I never have any luck. Say, uh, which ear do you use when you talk on the phone? Left ear, of course. Any dope knows that. All right, look here. Stella Trent is holding the telephone to the right ear. Well, maybe she's left-handed. So you're going to try to prove the Pomeroy killed her simply because she's got the phone to the wrong ear. Suppose you were in love with a man. He's broken your heart. Life isn't worth living. You decide to kill yourself. But you're going to punish him by making him listen to that fatal shot. Do you mean to tell me that you make the most important telephone call of your life by holding the receiver to the wrong ear? I've never killed myself, so don't ask me. Try it. But before you go off the deep end, riddle me this. If Pomeroy killed her, how did he manage the phone call to her sweetheart? Are you sure she actually did make that call? Of course I'm sure. I interviewed Dr. Baylor myself within an hour after the story broke. All right, I'm going to interview him again. What's his number? I don't know. Look it up. Dr. James E. Baylor, professional building. I tell you, Baylor, I don't like it. Yes? Mr. Lennigan? The bulletin? Yes, but look here. No. Of course I don't mind. In a half an hour. Very well. Steve Lonigan, eh? What did he want? He's digging into the Stella Trent case. He wants to ask me a few questions. Say, Maggie, what kind of a doctor is Dr. Baylor? I ear, nose, and throat. I ear, nose, and throat. Why? Stella Trent was holding the receiver to the wrong ear. So? Oh, nothing. Just thinking. Mm, that is unusual. Maybe he gave us up. We're 20 minutes late. Sign says he's in. It also says, please be seated. So it does. Ah, uh, maybe he's got a patient with him. Okay. If he's in, why doesn't he answer the phone? He probably went out and forgot to take the sign down. We'll answer the phone for him. No. Go on, answer the phone. Well, all right.
answer it. It's giving me the creeps. Somebody cut his throat. all that I know about my daughter's death, Mr. Lonigan. I feel quite certain that this horrible thing that happened to Dr. Baylor has nothing to do with what happened to Stella. Mrs. Trent, what kind of man was Dr. Baylor? I don't know. Well, you see, I didn't even know that Stella, well, went with him until it came out in all the papers. But didn't you talk to him... Uh... After it happened? Yes, at the inquest, but only for a moment. He seemed very nice. And he was sure, positive, that the girl who telephoned him was your daughter? I asked him that, naturally. He was quite sure. And you're positive that your daughter did take her own life? One never likes to think that of a loved one. But in Stella's case, I'm afraid that's the way it was. I never like to think of her as dead. Sometimes it isn't so difficult. I can hear her voice, and I... I mean, I can really hear her voice. I'll show you. Hello, Mother. Hello, Dad. This is Stella. I couldn't find a card that said just how much love and good luck I want to give you on your anniversary, so... so I had this record made. You know, ever since I was a little girl, I've... I've wanted to tell you... Gee, that was sweet of her. She was one of the sweetest girls that ever lived. Always so happy and full of life. Well, then what makes you think she killed herself? Excuse me. You're barking up the wrong tree, Steve. Looks like it. There was something in my daughter's life that she never confided to me. Possibly her association with Dr. Baylor. I don't know what it was. But I feel sure that she would have mentioned it in this, her diary. Well, haven't you ever read it? No, I, I've only had it a short time. It was in a trunk that she had in storage. May I... may I have a look at it, please? Oh, after it's all, Steve. Quite all right. So you see why I haven't read it. Well, some stenographer could have deciphered it for you. I felt that it was sacred to her. That's why she kept it in shorthand. It wouldn't do any good to resurrect her secret. Wouldn't make me any happier. Wouldn't bring her back. Mrs. Trent, I don't think your daughter killed herself. I think she was murdered. May I borrow this? I... I hardly know what to say. I treasure it highly, and if anything should happen to it, I... I... He's right, Mrs. Trent. If your daughter was murdered, you want to punish the one who did it, don't you? And I'd like to take this record of your daughter's voice. Oh, Mr. I'll guarantee to return them both to you in good condition. Well, all right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Goodbye. Goodbye. You think you can read her shorthand? Well, every girl has her own peculiar style. It's pretty difficult. Can you do it or can't you? That's all we want to know. Well, I can try. Well, come right over here and try.
And listen to this. Another quarrel with Poppigan's about the apartment. He went home early. Well, he's going to marry me or else. Why, it's as clear as day, Corbin. Pomeroy gave her the big rush, put her up in an apartment, promised to marry her, and then tried to shake her off. Everything's here. Motive, opportunity, everything. Ah, no, that doesn't prove a thing. In the first place, we don't know that Stella Trent was murdered. In the second place, we don't know that Pomeroy is, uh, Poppikins. In the third place, I'm not investigating the death of the girl. I'm trying to find out who killed Dr. Baylor. Get me Pomeroy at his home. And I'm going to fit all three facts into a first-degree murder indictment against Pomeroy. Oh, how? Hello? Yeah, put him on. Hello, Pomeroy? This is Steve Lonigan of the Bulletin. I just wanted to tell you to be sure and listen to my next broadcast. I think you'll find it very interesting. Hello, Mr. Pomeroy. My name is Flanagan. I want to inquire about some investments. Mr. Walsh referred me to you. I'm about to leave for my office. Perhaps you'd like to discuss it there. Oh, you won't be back until Saturday, I see. Well, how much were you thinking of investing? Well, for an investment of 25,000 in quick action, I would recommend National Petroleum. It's due for a rise. Now? It opened at 15 and a half. Thank you. I'll expect a call from you on Saturday. What's that? There were a couple of securities I wanted to ask about. California Steel and Consolidated Bankers. California Steel is selling at 39, but is due to drop off sometime during the morning. That's just what I wanted to find out. It's very kind of you, Mr. Pomeroy. I'll call you Saturday. Goodbye. Well, it's pretty hard to tell over the phone, but I think I can imitate his voice. All right, let's hear it. California Steel is selling at 39, but is due to drop off sometime during the morning. That's got a Chang. Now go into rehearsal. Come on, Megan. Steve. If you get this station into any more slander suits... Now, take it easy. Look at your franchise from the Radio Commission. Every station has to devote part of its time to public service. Yes. But... And if it isn't public service to catch a murderer, sue me. I will. And so, on your wedding anniversary, all I can think of to say is good luck, God bless you, and thank you for being my father and mother. Gee, Steve, that gets you. I feel like bowling. Yeah, I know. Can you double her voice? Well, I've listened to the record four times. Let's hear it. And so on your... No. And so on your wedding anniversary, all I can think of to say is... That's got it, Barbara. Here's your script. Now get out there and act, and act like you've never acted before. I know. Act good. Maybe you're right, Steve. But if this gag doesn't work, you're certainly going to feel like the rear end of a shoe. Don't worry. It'll work all right. And I'd sure like to see Pomeroy's face when he hears the broadcast. Let's do a rehearsal, Jack. Right away, Steve. Okay, kids, let's go. the news. Beginning tonight, the Evening Bulletin presents a brand new feature of this exciting program. A feature produced in cooperation with the district attorney's office. Unsolved Crimes. Our future happiness. As the first in the series of unsolved crimes, the evening bulletin presents the case of Stella Trent. Three years ago, Stella Trent, a beautiful young stenographer, was found dead in her apartment, a revolver in her hand, apparently a suicide. But today, District Attorney Willard Corbin says, I'm convinced the death of Stella Trent was not suicide, but murder. And I'm further convinced that the death of Stella Trent is, in some mysterious way, linked with a recent fiendish butchery of Dr. James E. Baylor. Where are you going? Call the radio station. They can't get away with this. Well, what are you excited about? Listen. The scene is the office of District Attorney Corbin. The time, late this afternoon. District Attorney Corbin is alone in his office as one of his investigators enters. 
Well, Callahan, anything new on the Stella Trent case? Yes, sir, Mr. Corbin. I was out to see her mother. She gave me the dead girl's diary. Anything important in it? I can't tell yet, Chief. It's in shorthand. Shorthand, eh? Hmm. Better have it transcribed by one of our stenographers. Right. It may give us a clue as to who killed Stella Trent. I didn't know she kept a diary. Neither did I. It is several hours later. Stenographers have transcribed the contents of Stella Trent's diary. And like a voice from the grave, Stella Trent speaks, giving to the district attorney a day-by-day -day recital of the events leading up to her death. Listen. January 14th, snowing again. I've got so I hate snow. I hate everything. Quarreled with Poppikins again tonight, and I'm getting a little tired of it. He came to the apartment late and said... Stella, I've got bad news for you. Bad news, Poppikins? Well, good or bad, depending on how you look at it. Don't say it. Don't say it, Poppikins. Stella, after all, we've got to be sensible. Albert, they're deliberately reproducing your voice. You've got to stop it, Walsh. Stop it? How? Oh. Sue them, get an injunction, anything. Don't you see what they're trying to do? They're trying to get a rise out of you. And if you give them the slightest indication that they got you worried, they're going to beat that slander suit. And I don't care what they're trying to do, and I don't care about the slander suit. These broadcasts have got to stop. And cooperating with the evening bulletin, District Attorney Corbin has placed Stella Trent's diary in the hands of Steve Lonegan, who will dramatize excerpts from the diary every night until the murderer of Stella Trent is placed under arrest. If you can't stop these broadcasts, I can. And I will. Hey, me too. Look at here. I'd sure like to know who that was. Well, if you ask me, I'd say it was Pumpkins. Can't burglarize your home. He did. A man's home's his castle. Maybe Poppikins doesn't read the classics. If you only had some proof that it was Pomeroy. I know it was. That's all the proof I need. But you can't arrest him on mere suspicion. If he beat the case, he'd have another damage suit against us. Is the bulletin responsible for my personal quarrels? No. Well, stop worrying. Steve, now don't do anything rash. But, uh, would you let him have one for me? Yes? Mr. Jerome Walsh to see you, sir. Walsh, you tell him Wait to... Wait a minute. Why not see him? Tell him to come in. What do you suppose he wants? I don't know. Maybe we can scare him a bit. Good morning. I wonder if you... Well, were... Walsh, Pomeroy's finally gone a bit too far. I don't get you. He burglarized my apartment last night. There's a law against breaking into people's apartments. Did Pomeroy do that? He certainly did. Now, see here, Walsh, I won't stand for it. Maybe Pomeroy has us behind the eight ball, as far as that lawsuit's concerned. But he's not going to commit burglary on my employees. I'll have him arrested. You're quite right, Colonel. The man should be arrested. Gentlemen, I've had a shock. A severe shock. I've just discovered that Pomeroy did murder Edward Webster. He did? Yes. What is this, Walsh? Another one of your tricks? If it is, it's liable to get me disbarred. Where'd you get this astounding information? From Mrs. Webster. She told you Pomeroy killed her husband? That's right. And yet she's getting ready to marry him. It's just a gag, Steve. Just a gag. As old as the hills. She's known right along that Pomeroy was guilty. Yet she pretended to believe him innocent. Pretended she was in love with him. Why? So that she could save from Pomeroy's corporation the money her husband had invested in it. Now that she's got things and... So she told you Pomeroy's guilty. That's right. Walt, you're lying. Now, wait a minute. But Steve, the man's telling us something that'll save me a million dollars. What do we care if he is lying? What I want to know is why he's lying. I've met a lawyer or two in my life, and I've never met one yet who discussed his client's affairs with the enemy. If you're telling the truth, you can prove it by withdrawing Pomeroy's suit. I'm sorry, I can't do that. Oh. That's entirely up to him. But I did come here to tell you that that I've withdrawn as his counsel. 
And I'm telling you this because I thought you might like to be the one to tell the district attorney about it. You mean that? Absolutely. Well, what good will that do? Corbin can't rearrest Pomeroy. Not for the Webster murder. But what about the death of Stella Trent? I heard that broadcast last night. What made you think Pomeroy was Poppykins? What do you think? I don't have to think. Mrs. Webster also told me that Pomeroy was rather seriously involved with the Trent girl. Well, that's enough to convict Pomeroy. Will Mrs. Webster testify to that? If I advise her to. Then why do we stand here arguing? Get Mrs. Webster up here, have her make a statement, and give it to the district attorney. It won't be as simple as that. Oh. I'm afraid Pomeroy suspects Mrs. Webster. You mean she may be in some danger? No, for I'm taking precautions. I've got a hunting lodge up in the mountains. I've advised her to go up there for a day or two until we can confer with the district attorney. Pomeroy won't know where she is. She'll be safe, and she can get back here in three hours when we need her. Well, not that I doubt you, but you wouldn't by any chance be pulling a fast one, would you? <laughs> Send somebody along with her if you like. She knows I'm here. She'll cooperate to the fullest extent. When is Mrs. Webster leaving for the mountains? In an hour. I'll have a girl go with her. Right. Pretty drive, isn't it? Hmm? Oh, yes. I know how awful you must feel, but after all, it will be good to get it off your chest. I suppose so. Didn't it drive you nearly crazy, carrying a secret like that around, locked up inside of you? I made up my mind Albert Pomeroy would pay for my husband's death, but that he'd pay my way. I wanted him punished. But sending him to the chair wouldn't help me any. Are you sure you have matters arranged so that you will really get your husband's money out of the business? Quite sure. Oh. How much farther? Not far. Well, of all the unmitigated examples of malfeasance and misfeasance in office... Oh, what do you want me to do? Arrest Pomeroy and Walsh say so? Sure, why not? Because that's probably exactly what Walsh wants. Now, you made it pretty clear in your broadcast last night, Steve, that you suspect Pomeroy of killing Stella Trent. This is a trick of Walsh's to goad me into a premature arrest, which he'll promptly explode in our faces and then sue you all over again. Walsh is pretty cute, all right. If we could only force Pomeroy's hand, scare him into making some guilty move. Say, that might be arranged. Suppose I were to broadcast the announcement that Stella Trent's murder is to be picked up at 10 o'clock tonight. No, Steve, you're putting me in a spot. If Pomeroy's guilty, he'll take it on the lamb, won't he? Well, he might. Oh, come on, Corbin. I can always broadcast the statement that you've changed your plans. All right, we'll do it. And here is the announcement we've been waiting for. As a result of sensational disclosures in the diary of Stella Trent, District Attorney Corbin late today promised that before 10 o'clock tonight, her murderer will be taken into custody. <clears throat> What's the matter with you? Do you have to sneak in here like that? I'm sorry, sir, but I thought you'd like to know. I've located Mrs. Webster for you, sir. Good work. As you know, sir, I'm rather friendly with Mrs. Webster's maid, sir. And the very yes, first... Yes, yes, I know, I know. Where is Mrs. Webster? She's gone to the mountains, sir. Mr. Walsh has let her take his hunting lodge for a few days. Walsh, eh? Will there be anything else, sir? No, no, that's all. Yes. Now, just a moment. Have my car sent around. To hear the broadcast, then what? Well, if he's left for parts unknown, Corbin can throw out the dragnet. Yeah, and if Pomeroy didn't run out, Corbin will send after you with a butterfly net. Is Mr. Pomeroy at home? Aren't you the magician, gentlemen, sir? Yes, but can we let bygones be bygones? Mr. Pomeroy is not at home. I said Mr. Pomeroy is not at home. Oh, Mr. Pomeroy isn't home. Well, where did he go? Did he take any luggage with it? You'd best ask Mr. Pomeroy himself. He just left for Mr. Walsh's hunting lodge in the mountains. Walsh's hunting lodge? Oh, where is it? We've got to get to a telephone. Is he gone? Yeah, just now. To Walsh's hunting lodge. We've got to find out where it is and beat him up there.
Mr. Walsh doesn't keep any servants here. We'll have to cook our own dinner. What? No butler? Oh, well, we can rough it for <laughs> once. We may have to if the lights are shut off. Pretty snappy story the other day. Like to hear it? Yeah, if you make it snappy. Snappy it is. Once upon a time, this little girl, she's going through the woods and met a wolf in the woods and the wolf says, Oh, kid, where are you going? She says, well, I don't know. I'm picking some milk over on a gambler. I'm breaking him a new red hat. So the wolf says, Where are you going to let him get? And he gets it right away in the woods away. She always pointed the thumb of his cat racing at the girl. So the wolf ran around ahead of her, ate her grandma up and grandma's clothes and got grandma's a bit of the grandma's nightcap on. And when the little girl, she knows the wolf's thumb, grandma sees, looks at it, says, Grandma, why didn't you wait till I got here with the milk? You'll be drinking that hair tonic again. Look at your arms, all hair like Uncle George. And the wolf said, Oh, yeah. You know how wolf gets sarcastic and said, Oh, yeah. You're running out of gas. Thanks. I wish you would. Soup's on. Thanks. Beans, canned salmon, coffee, <laughs> and a slab of granite the ancient Indians probably used for bread. It's uh, not fancy, but filling. Ah, oh, come on, Mrs. Webster. Forget your troubles. Everything's going to be all right. Sorry. I'm not very good company, am I? What I can't figure out is how you could force yourself to pretend to love Pomeroy, knowing all the time he'd killed your husband. Wasn't easy. No wonder you're almost a nervous wreck. What would you do? He killed the only man I ever loved. He should have died for that. But if I'd let him go to the chair, I'd have lost everything my husband and I had worked years to get. I loathe the sight of Pomeroy. How many times I wanted to get up and scream. He did it. He killed my husband. But I forced myself to keep my secret. I had determined that even though Pomeroy had killed my husband, he wasn't going to rob him. You poor kid. The cabin we want belongs to Mr. Walsh, somewhere near Crestwood. Straight ahead, the second row, and turn left. You'll find a sign. Thank you. Why don't you relax? I wish I could. But I'm sure Albert suspects that I know the truth about him. And if he does, he wouldn't stop at murder. Well, I wouldn't worry if I were you. Before 10 o'clock, he'll be under arrest. Under arrest? For the murder of Stella Trent. Didn't you tell Walsh that Pomeroy killed her? Well, I'm not sure, of course. But I think he did. He knew her very well. If Pomeroy killed Stella Trent, he killed Dr. Baylor, too. Why? Because the doctor was killed while Steve and I were on our way to ask him about the Trent case. I didn't know that. Did you know Dr. Baylor? No. Cigarette? Oh, thanks. I prefer my own. I have some in my bag. Sit still, I'll get them for you. Too bad about Dr. Baylor. From all Albert told me, he was a nice fellow. Oh, then Pomeroy did know him. Very well. They were old schoolmates. And you didn't know Dr. Baylor? Of course not. Eli. Thanks. Why did you lie to me about Dr. Baylor? I 
I, um, I, I just didn't want to get mixed up in the investigation into his death. How well did you know him? He was treating me for an ear condition. I knew him rather well. Well enough to know that Pomeroy probably killed him too. <laughs> Well, night for a murder. If you think Pomeroy killed Dr. Baylor, the district attorney should know that too. Isn't it sufficient that I've told you all I know? How can I swear that he killed him? Listen, Mrs. Webster. They can only execute Pomeroy once. But each murder that we pin on will make that one execution all the more certain. I... I don't know what to do. Call Walsh. Tell him to come up here. Do you think I should? Yes, I do. I'd feel safer with a man in the house anyway. Well? All right. Operator, will you give me New York City? Endicott 2, 6598. Oh, will you call me back? staring at do you always hold the phone to your right ear why yes my left ear has been defective ever since I fell when I was a child that's why dr. Baylor was treating me when Stella Trent was found she had the receiver in her right hand yes I know Strange, isn't it? Very strange. And very clever of you to associate it with me. I never thought anything of the kind. Don't lie to me. You've suspected me from the first. I killed my husband because he stood between Albert and me. And I killed Stella Trent for the same reason. Dr. Baylor because he was going to tell the police it was you who telephoned from her apartment after she was murdered. Albert! Oh, darling! This is hardly the time or place for sentiment, Muriel. You're going back to town with me and surrender yourself to the police before they arrest me the way you planned. Give me that knife. I was only fighting for time, Albert. Those broadcasts about the diary terrified me. All I wanted was time. Time to think, to figure things out. I never intended you should be arrested. You told Walsh I killed Stella Trent and Dr. Baylor. No, Muriel. I don't care to stand trial for any more of your demonstrations of affection for me. I'm taking you back to town. Give me that knife. Don't try to stop me. Don't try to follow me. No, you're hurt. Muriel. She can't get far. Mrs. Webster, are you all right? Yes, I'm all right. That's Pomeroy's car. Where is he? Miss Shane has him. I loaned him my gun. She wants me to telephone the police. Well, where's the nearest phone? I don't know. Try the main road. Well, come on, get in. Smiley, go in and help Maggie. Well, come on, get in. Well, get in. We'll be back as soon as we can. Don't move. What's the matter with you? Everything's all right. Mrs. Webster is the murderess. Mrs. Webster? Yes. Why? She's with Steve in his car. Oh, my gosh. What time is it? Five minutes to ten. Why? What are you going to do? Hello. Operator. Give me New York City, circle 79950. Hurry, please. Take your time. There's no hurry. Pomeroy's a pretty slick article. He may pull a fast one on Maggie and Smiley. I wouldn't want them to get hurt. Don't worry. 
They won't get hurt. But he's already killed a couple of people. Her husband, Stella Trent, and probably Dr. Baylor. Say, Corbin will be able to keep his promise at that. What promise? To arrest Pomeroy at 10 o'clock tonight. It's nearly that now. Let's listen to the broadcast. So you really think Pomeroy killed all those people? A doubt in the world. <laughs> I'm glad you think so. Special broadcast to Steve Lonigan. Steve, if you are listening, and if Muriel Webster is with you, be careful. She's the murderess you've been looking for, and your life may be in danger. Say, what is this? Just keep quiet. And drive. Wish you'd put that gun away until we get around these curves. Shut up! Jump! Jump, I tell you! After which Jerome Walsh re-engaged his counsel for Albert Pomeroy, withdrew the slander suits against the Evening Bulletin and this radio station. And now a little scene which was enacted this afternoon in the chambers of Judge Samuel Clark. Do you, Stephen Lonigan, take this woman to be your lawful wedded wife? I do. Do you, Margaret Shane, take this man to be your lawful wedded husband? I do. I now pronounce you man and wife. Greetings. We hope you enjoy watching Hastings Mystery Theater and the film you just viewed. Randall Schaefer, his wife Judy and program manager Dan LeClaire combined efforts to bring these productions to you, free of charge and almost always without ads. We love seeing the comments you leave about our movies in the comments section under each video production. This means so much to us. Also, Randall appreciates receiving and responding to your many emails. Thank you viewers, for liking, commenting and subscribing to our channel, and hit the notification bell so you won't miss an upload. Blessings to you, from Hastings, Michigan, USA. Keep up with us, we enjoy having you here, hope you enjoy us. Thank you, bye.